good afternoon and welcome back to our next session. This will all be about bringing down barriers, what building an all-inclusive society means. This will be chaired by the Global Director for Urban and Territorial Development, Disaster Risk Management and Resilience from the World Bank, Sameh Naguib Waba. On the panel speaking, we will have the Chief Technology and Digital Innovation Officer from Barcelona City Council, Francesca Bria. We also will have the EVP Global Cities Manager from MasterCard, Miguel Gamino. Also, the Secretary General for UCLG, Emilia Saez. And finally, the VP of Customer Experience, IoT and Incubation from Cisco, Joseph Bradley. Please welcome them to the stage. Good afternoon. Buona tarda. Buenas tardes. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have you all with us in the session on bringing down barriers. What does building an inclusive society mean? Uh, my name is Sameh Wahba. I'm the director uh, at the World Bank uh, in a global practice that's responsible for urban territorial development, disaster risk management, social inclusion, disability, indigenous people, and land right issues. And inclusive cities for us at the World Bank, smart and inclusive cities, means cities that excel at tackling three different domains of exclusion. The first is spatial exclusion. It's the inability of the population to access land, housing, infrastructure and services. The second domain is the inability of the population to access job opportunities and you know, uh, opportunities for income generation. And the third domain is social exclusion, which is the lack of voice and accountability and an ability of the population to meaningly, meaningfully participate in shaping their trajectories. Now, for, in order for us to look into the issue of how do we build smart and inclusive cities, cities that are really intended to bring about the benefits that urbanization brings in terms of poverty reduction and reduction of inequalities, we have brought in together for you a fantastic panel. We have with us Francesca Bria, she's the chief technology and digital innovation officer and commissioner at the Barcelona City Council. Next to her is Miguel Gamino, who's the executive vice president of Global Cities at MasterCard, formerly chief technology officer of New York City. Uh, next to him, uh, Emilia Saiz, who's the secretary general of United Cities and Local Government, the largest local government grouping with over 250,000 members. And last but not least, Mr. Joseph Bradley, the Global Vice President for Customer Experience and IoT at Cisco. Now we have three questions for them, and then we'll open it up for uh, discussion. The first question is, and we're going to start with Francesca, is how can policy and technology contribute towards building those smart and inclusive cities for all, cities that tackle spatial exclusion, economic exclusion, and social exclusion. Francesca. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Um, yes, if we want to build a more inclusive and smart, democratic, and sustainable city, uh, I think it's about building a city of rights and not just a city of privilege. So when it comes in particular to technology policy, I think it's very important that we start with uh, what uh, citizens really need. And we start from the challenges that we have, uh, the urban and social challenges that we're facing, and make sure actually that technology, it's not accelerating the um, uh, widening inequalities or disparities that we see. So I get uh, sometimes a bit nervous when I see these statistics that show you that um, 
you see digitalization, which is actually increasing inequalities, in particular uh, when we talk about global south versus north, but also when we talk about wealth accumulation and the rich versus the poor. So I think, you know, my idea of my idea or the Barcelona uh, vision for an inclusive city is an open city where you can mix um, races, where you can mix uh, people, rich people and poor people in open democratic spaces and I would say technology comes after so you have to start with a big challenges like affordable housing uh, like healthcare for all uh, like sustainable mobility energy transition and fight climate change and then after we ask how can we make sure that technology and data um, would help us and if we govern the technology properly in an inclusive way technology will become a mean to solve those kind of challenges. So for that particular reason, I think we really want to um, democratize, uh, in particular, the question of ownership of data and artificial intelligence. So we all know that uh, if we walk around here in the smart city, we see how much all the amount of data that is gathered by citizens, by uh, platforms, uh, urban platforms, by you know companies and, s and even cities themselves, uh, will you know transform the industry governments and society so we want to make sure uh, that we can democratize the access to data and the control over data so we talk a lot about data sovereignty or technological sovereignty which means that um, citizens themselves have to understand what is the direction of technological change so that we are sure that again we can unleash collective intelligence of our citizens first of all uh, but then also use this technology for the public interest for the common good um, so um, I would make an example, and I'm sure that uh, later on we will get into talking about more details. Uh, but for us, the question of recent citizen participation and how you making sure that it's not government just setting the challenges or the missions and then cooperating with the private sector or technology ecosystem to solve the problems, that, but that we start with citizens themselves. So um, we are uh, in Barcelona running a really large scale participatory process. 400,000 citizens were involved in, an, in a hybrid online and offline participation pro process to set the agenda of the government. So our action plan today, 70% of the proposal, which are our action plan in government, came directly from citizens. And we engage in this very sometimes conflictual negotiation and sometimes really empowering um, participatory process with citizens, where we made sure that we align the technology agenda with the neighborhood plan so that you make sure that you have cities ca uh, citizens coming from different neighborhoods, from different socioeconomic background, different ages, different ethnic background, and also gender, so that you make sure, you know, uh, you make a feminist city also together with a digital and a uh, more democratic city. And then you see how the brain power of, of citizens themselves and their ideas, their challenges, but in particular what they really need become part of the, of the broader policy of the city. So in that respect, I think when we are talking about citizens themselves being part of constructing or co-shaping or building its city really means it's not only up to experts, but it's about inclusive inclusive and bottom-up grassroots participatory approaches to define what an inclusive city should look like excellent thank you Francesca for setting the stage you spoke about policy and then technology as the enabler about governance and about planning at both the city level and at the neighborhood level uh, Miguel you've worked I mean you are you know today with MasterCard uh, you were before with the city of New York you know you wore the two hats can you share with us your experience, I mean, from today's private sector perspective, but also how you worked across the two realms? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> also, thank you for, for having me. It's, it's always great to uh, sit among friends and talk about things that we are passionate about. Um, and I, I echo everything that was already stated, um, uh, in part because we've had an a ongoing conversation for many years about how important this, this topic is. And I think um, 
you know, not only is it important to think about technology and policy as the, the tool, not the, the outcome, right? The outcome is about, um, as Francesca said, the, the priorities of people and the needs and wants of people and to do that in an inclusive manner. I think having been on the public service side and the private sector side, I have a, a, a deep appreciation for how important it is for that collaboration to exist on the solution piece, right? So we talk a lot about um, inclusion in terms of bringing people in to, to help define and co-develop the solution, and that's absolutely key. I, I think making sure that we include the people in the process that we're trying to serve is the best way to, to hit the target in terms of uh, accomplishing that inclusive outcome. I think we also have to think about it similarly when you talk about the, the people or the organizations who possess the resources to help build those solutions. That also needs to be inclusive. That also needs to be um, representative of the, of the different components of the solution that need to be put together. So it is, you know, again, always centered on the people and the outcomes, but I think a, a, a sense of empathy between the public sector and the private sector would help us uh, make a lot more progress collaboratively when the, the public sector can respect the, the valuable contributions that can be made by the private sector um, and that the private sector can respect the, the obligations that, that the government has to its people. That's when I think you start to hit uh, the sweet spot and you start to find really um, uh, in, not only inclusive but very meaningful and valuable solutions get built. And I, I, I experienced it in New York where we, we brought in the community and we brought in the private sector and we were the government and uh, we thought we were solving a pretty straightforward issue. Um, and the solution that got built was more comprehensive. It was, uh, in one case, we were trying to address uh, waste management and we didn't get into a conversation about trash cans, we got into a conversation about using data to identify the problem better, activate the community in developing the solution, and what resulted out of that was not only managing the, the waste issue better, but it also created a small business for the community to as a participant in the solution, and all kinds of very interesting outcomes that probably wouldn't have been surfaced had you not had that collection of voices at the table. And so I think the you know, w there's a kind of a phrase that, that I've coined, if you will, that I think the, the collaboration is the superpower. Um, that getting cities to work together with, with, the, with each other and have the conversation to better define the challenges and then seeking out uh, a comprehensive set of, of private sector partners, I think will give you the best outcome. I think we'll find not only solutions that hit the mark with the needs of people, but by having the private sector invested, uh, in many cases, you, you solidify the legacy. Because at some point, it, by design, the mayor's office is going to turn over. But if you've engaged the private sector in a way that is valuable to them, uh, they in many ways become the guardian of the legacy and help uh, uh, sustain the solution and the impact going forward. And so I'm very proud of our organization because uh, the, the program that we're building with regard to cities that we call City Possible uh, is really centered on the, the active listening first, helping cities engage with each other so that we can better understand what the needs are and only then mobilizing our resources and our assets and those of our partners to help address the solution the way that it's been defined by the people and the representatives of the people. Excellent, thank you very much, Riel. This sets the stage. I mean, you've emphasized the importance of collaboration, not only for comprehensive solutions, but also for ensuring that they're long-lasting solutions that can transcend political change. Emilia, you represent 250,000 cities and local governments across a great range of capacities, income levels, collaboration levels. Realities, cultures. <laughs> what do you see from your vantage point? Mm. I think for us, I mean, first of all, I, I would like to comment how this conversation is changing. I think that those of us that have been in this place before, uh, in previous years, we can really sense how, uh, how um, the will of the people and the people-centered solutions are really taken over 
the technological solutions. And there is a real shift, and I think this, this is extremely important. Um, for us, the main uh, answer to your first question would be, well, technology is not an aim in itself. It's simply the solution, and Francesca has put it in saying, well, technology comes, comes later. Uh, it's a good narrative. It's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really happening. I mean, I do think that many of my members are trying to do that, but the reality is that the capacity of development that private companies have in terms of product, product research, those departments are so huge, and they are going like rockets, and they are talking with very few people. They are talking with elites. They are not talking with the people that Francesca is trying to service. I mean, I, I, I'm putting this in streams because I want to touch on, 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 the real, on, on the real issues. The reality is that many of my cities, and not all our cities are New York and Barcelona and, you know, uh, I've got cities that are much less known. Um, those cities are treated very often as buyers. And citizens are treated like clients and users. That's the reality of the conversation, and that's what needs to change. And I do know there is a huge, a vast group of, 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 of private sector and public sector that is trying to change this conversation, but we are not there yet. And this is why from these three areas that you describe, Same, as the areas that you need to work on to make sure that you make an inclusive city, which is the spatial, um, the growth job related and the voice and, and, and participation uh, area, for us the latter is the most important one. I mean, you will be able to influence your space, you will be able to influence your future when you have solid institutions that are shaped answering to your expectations and, and to your needs. And those systems of participation need to be strengthened. And in order to do that, we need to stop seeing each other as those in different parts of the table. Citizens need to stop looking at governments like the ones that need to solve their crisis. Because at the end of the day, as citizens, when we go back home and we take our hat off um, as official or whatever, we are not waiting around to be governed. We have come to cities simply because we are more creative there together, because we like to live in communities, and because we basically want to be happy. I was looking at the intro video saying, is nice enough? No, we need to be connected. And I'm like, no, I don't want to be connected. I just want to be happy. And, some, and sometimes I am happy being connected, but many times I'm not happy being connected and you guys knowing every single thing I do. <laughs> no, I don't want you to invade my email with shopping bags because I wanted to give one as a present to my mother by Christmas, you know. No, that's not the kind of connectivity I want. So I do think that this conversation is changing, but it's, it's not... You know, it's, it's, it's kind of not there yet, and, and I think that, that the public and uh, the partnership of public and private sector that you were aiming at, uh, which is, is a starting to be shaped, needs uh, still to do a qualitative leap forward to actually um, move much more to product design together. When that happens, when, when, when that actually happens, then I think we will have changed the relationship and we will have changed the quality of the dialogue. I'm not saying that there is no will to do this. I'm just saying that like many transformations that we are going through, we don't really know how to do it yet. And I finished with one challenge that I think that many of our cities are facing is that we have gone from no consultation at all to a lot of consultation and not knowing what to do with it. Mm. And sometimes, you know, you are, you are elected officials, you are government because you need to take the responsibility for certain decisions and you need to explain them well, but you cannot put every single thing on, on, on the citizen. And this very thin line between 
participation and consultation and active co-creation is one that we are still trying to shape out. And most of our legal systems, let's face it, are not ready for that change. And the public-private partnerships are also really limited by the legal frameworks that we have to back those partnerships up. So I leave it at that for now. Yeah. That's a very rich uh, array of issues, Emilia. I mean, you spoke about not only social inclusion is critical within a city, but also across cities, because there are cities that have various different levels of capacity, and they range between the true partnerships versus the no partnerships, the, the buying of options, and the range of between consultation to no consultation to over consultation. So great food for thought. Joseph, if you please you know, bring your perspective. Great. Um, so happy to be here and, and uh, excited to participate in the panel. Uh, it's always good to go last, but it's and, 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 right? Uh, agree with uh, everything that's said. Let, let me try to add a, a little bit of a, maybe additional perspective. Mm. Uh, first, I would say that it's very important. It's great to hear us talking about inclusion, but I think it's also important to understand you got to start with basic diversity. Mm -hmm. So to me, diversity is the potential to create value. You may have a very diverse room or you may have a very, very diverse city. Inclusion is the realization of that value by driving strong and full participation. So from a standpoint of corporate and, and the public partnership, I think from a corporation standpoint, we have to be recognized that there is a diverse group of citizenships within a city, not just the wealthy, not just poor, there's a diverse group. And so we need to make sure that first, when we're talking about products or talking about service or talking whatever, that we have a very rich, diverse representation of the true citizens that, that represent the world that we live in. Secondly, this notion of, I think, driving full participation is really important. I think there's two things. One is context is king. And what do I mean by context is king is we all want to interact with the world differently. We all, um, that may change based on our economic status, may change on our family status, may change on where we live, what we're doing. But the point is, is if you want to drive participation, we have to make that experience adaptable to what that citizen is doing at that time and that moment in time. And that may change from week to week, from day to day to minute to yeah. minute. So context is really, really uh, important. The last thing I would tell you is security is critically important, obviously. But if you want to drive participation, security again is an outcome. The emotion that you want to drive is trust. Without trust, you can't gain full participation. And so when you think about the world that we live in, I think a question that we have to ask ourselves is, well, what does that mean in a world where you have diversity and inclusion in a world where you have machines and AI and artificial intelligence? I think ultimately what it means when you say trust, it means you have to go beyond security and we have to talk about data integrity. It's not good for the data to be secure. If you're making decisions, it's gotta be right, right? And so I think it's important that we begin to, to breach beyond security and really, really adopt and embrace uh, the notion of, of integrity. And, and the last thing I would say, I think oftentimes when we talk about uh, smart connected communities and we talk about inclusion, we get so wrapped up in uh, what we don't know. We get so wrapped up and energized about what's coming and what's happening, what's coming. <laughs> and I think Today is a time that we as citizens, that we as leaders, we as a people, uh, as a community, need to stop worrying about what we don't know. And we should rather think about and challenge each and every day what we believe to be fundamentally true. Because it is, it is those things, it is those biases, it is those beliefs that are ultimately going to determine whether or not we can create and bridge the gap between the cities that we have today and the cities that we want to have in the future. Thank you very much, Joseph. You said inclusion is the realization of the value of diversity. So in order for us to achieve this inclusion for all, who, who are those all? I mean, there's very different ranges of underprivileged, underrepresented groups as far as 
policies and as far as the realization of investments, there are gender dynamics, there are age dynamics, the elderly, the youth, uh, there are um, religious dynamics, there are um, you know, L LGBTI inclusion, there are disability concerns. Can, you, can I ask each of the panel members to take us a little bit forward on how do we achieve this meaningful inclusion for all? Yeah. First of all, just let me say, maybe reflecting uh, on what the panel just said, that I think the question of trust and the question of participation are not a choice. You know, I think that we are in a moment where we're facing maybe the biggest crisis of uh, trust and crisis of political representation. And we also are faced, we are in a moment where if you look at the situation and some of the challenges, you know, widening inequalities, climate change, migration, but also wage stagnation. Um, people don't believe, they actually don't believe that either government on one side or corporations are going to have the solutions for the future. So there is this kind of uh, lack of trust that, that I think you can only address or, I mean, of course, the other uh, wave that we see is the kind of rising nationalism and, uh, and uh, populism on one side. But if you want to counter that, obviously, I think that the solution is this uh, participatory democracy in a sense of being inclusive and starting from the needs of, of, of the people. So I actually think any, it's not a, a choice anymore. We just have to do it and engage in this, and the question is how to do it. So coming to, to the point of um, who are these people, I think, um, I mean, obviously the situation is different if you are in the global south, if you are in more privileged cities, but I think we are seeing um, everywhere that the boundaries are and the, and the and the borders are very porous. So in cities you find, you know, um, natives and immigrants having to live together. You find different classes and different race, you know, that need to coexist. And I think within those kind of uh, differences, we have to make sure we build more democratic spaces for, for dialogue, but also really to address policies. Um, I think I was very, very interested by looking at the data. As I told you, we do these large uh, democratic participation processes, and we also use a platform. It's called Decidim Barcelona. It's all free software. People control the data. So no manipulation of data, behavioral analysis, and all the mess that we saw on big platforms. But I was very interested to see this is not just digital natives in, uh, in uh, upper class neighborhood that, you know, have time to engage. Actually, we see over 65 people, many people participate. Uh, we see gender balance. We are trying at least to do our best to kind of empower women in technology, but also in participation. And we see that the key is if you ask people to participate on affordable housing, uh, of course, people care because this is about can we make sure that the price of our house doesn't go to the roof and that we can afford the living. And this is something that people are passionate about if they live in a city. If you ask them, how about sustainable mobility? Can, like, for instance, we've done a participation process on creating um, more bicycle lanes and integrate there with uh, buses and, and a more kind of multimodal transportation system that would improve the air quality. So there are a lot of people want to participate of very different backgrounds because the problem is concrete. They see that you, know, you are improving air quality and noise pollution and this is real and it's gonna improve my, my neighborhood. So I think that's where if the problem is concrete and gets down to the community, it is, it is, it is actually including um, many more people that have totally different problems. And then finally, let me say, uh, we are also trying to work a lot uh, how the public and the private sector can collaborate in this. So we created a urban innovation lab, which is really a space where we are piloting a lot of these new methodologies, where the challenge is set by the public sector together with the citizens, so the people that know what the problem is. Again, make it tangible, make it concrete, that people understand it. Don't ask what a smart city is, because the majority of people don't know what it is, and they, and they want 
everyone participate. Um, and then uh, we open up these challenges. So we've done one now together with New York. Sorry you weren't there because you left, but we've done one yeah. last year, uh, where it's affordable housing. And so cities have a, a, a joint challenge. How can we build more affordable housing and do that with new material, more flexible uh, structure and so on? And then we ask the, the, the private companies, also startups, SMEs, innovators, not only the big company, to join in respond to a challenge. Uh, we have done that for women in tech, so empowering women in tech, which I'm very passionate about because we absolutely need this to become a more feminist revolution. We need more women to be a forefront to drive the digital revolution. Um, and basically, we opened up a challenge for making visible the talent of women in our city. And we saw a very good response, and that's where also you make this collaboration possible. And, um, and we are doing that also on other, tackling other uh, social issues. For instance, energy poverty in, is another one where you know, people get cut off because they cannot pay the energy bills. And now Barcelona has created a municipal uh, renewable energy operator, uh, solar mainly, that can provide energy, clean energy to over 20,000 uh, families that cannot afford to pay uh, the, the bills. So I think in this, in this um, piloting these new approaches to really um, get down to concrete projects, the only thing that we need then on top of that, um, I think is education, <laughs> which is the magical world, but I think really we do need to not only engage citizens in saying this is the information and access to the data, and this is the problem, of course, but then how can we make sure that we can have education programs that bring in also the complexity of new technologies. So we are trying to do a lot on that, uh, creating public fab labs, working together with schools, getting down to the neighborhood, and getting people more training and more education education so that they will be the shapers of, of the future. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to address your question and also address some of the comments because I, I agree with you, um, mostly because I lived it. So before I was the CTO of New York City, I was um, San Francisco and before that El Paso. And I haven't changed as a human. I, my, my vision has mostly been the same, but the attention I got when I was in El Paso is fundamentally different than the attention I got in New York. Now my response to that was how do we how do we again lean into this idea that cities can collaborate with each other. And so while I was in that role, the program that Francesca is referring to, um, we we created in New York, which was to engage the 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 private sector in response to these challenges that were informed by and created by the people they were intended to serve. And so we did that in New York. It's called NYCX and it was, it was very successful in achieving that, not only the engagement with cities, I mean with citizens or, or, or residents, but other cities for, for the purpose of extending our, our, our resource or our blessings of, of a big city to others. Sometimes Barcelona, but not, not limited to Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was, it was ab absolutely recognized that that had, had been a concern. I think the opportunity now um, is to expand on that. So the, the cities that we announced on Monday that are members of the, in, the initial uh, members of City Possible are not the postcards. Uh, they're not only the postcards. So San Diego is one, but so is uh, Campbellton, uh, Australia. Um, and so we're, I think, we're, we're, we're putting our actions where that narrative is going, right? And we're leading in that direction to engage industry partners, uh, NGOs, and academia in support of, of all kinds of types of cities, right, that serve different types of people in their community. Because what I, what I understood fundamentally was that no matter the language spoken or the size or the hemisphere, uh, most cities are trying to tackle many of the same issues. And that's why I had relationships with people like Bar uh, Francesca in Barcelona, because we were able to share with each other the challenges we were facing, even if we were half a world apart. And so I think that that, that is something that we are, we're, we're addressing what you have appropriately identified, which is um, the, the, the conversation has been evolving, and I'm proud to, to suggest that there are some of us who are acting on it in a, in a fundamentally um, meaningful, authentic, and, and important way. 
to not only do it with our, our assets, but bringing other partners to that conversation in support of that broader goal. So I think that's how we reach across, you know, I had a conversation just today uh, with a city in uh, Brazil, and the mayor asked me, he said, you know, do you want to serve our affluent part or the favela? And I said, all of it, mm -hmm. right? We authentically want to help find solutions that can bridge those gaps and deliver positive uh, outcomes across the board. And I think um, we, as a collective, should uh, celebrate those um, ambitions when, when, when the collaboration comes together to, to, to try to accomplish it. We should push forward um, and lead by example and help accomplish those inclusive goals with projects and support projects that, like those that are happening in Barcelona and those that are happening in, in other cities and towns around the world. And I think the industry, Cisco and others included, can put our resources behind trying to achieve that. And again, it's a long-term strategy that takes uh, a lot of vision and a lot of courage from leadership to, to, to play the long game here and to understand that doing it right is, uh, is as important as doing it at all. Excellent. Emilia? Yeah, no, I mean, that's where we started, saying that, that, the, that the conversation has evolved, but I think it's very important that we emphasize the, the, the relevance of having that evolution in, in the conversation. And in terms, of, um, in terms of what type of people do we address or how, how, who, I mean, what is inclusion? There is one aspect that, um, that I see um, is, is not uh, tackled in, in the way that we would like it to be seen tackled, and that is confusing many conversations we are having. Because very often we are looking at diversity, not at these, uh, at these shared possibilities that we have together, but as the differences that uh, separate us and by doing so, sometimes we are looking at things as if they are part of nature of beings and not part of the status of being. When you look at a person and you see a migrant, you uh, seem to be thinking that being a migrant is a nature, and that's not true. You can be a migrant at any moment. You probably are. When you look at me, you probably see a European white female. But I am many things, but mostly um, I, I'm not as European as you think. I am as female as you see, but I am also a migrant and that you don't see. Mm -hmm. And so if you have that kind of conversation and, and you go from nature to status, then the type of conversation changes and the type of policy that you need to make to actually include people like me and, and, and many others is, is very, very different. You need to deal with that in, in, a, in a different way. And it's, it's something that is not happening enough. And what we have seen in the past years, just like we had to learn the tough way that planning cities where you would only work or you would only live or you would only shop was a failure, just how we have heard the tough way, um, we are learning now the tough way that, you, that a specific policies for a specific groups only without giving them the opportunity to define how they live together is probably also wrong. And I have been working for a very long time on, on gender equality policies over, uh, overall in, in the world, not, not, not only in Europe or in a specific continent. And some of the solutions that are being implemented right now, like women-only public transport and that kind of solutions, are very tricky solutions. I mean, they are a very good sign in how committed local governments or national governments are to tackle a specific issue that needs to be tackled, but it might not be the right way to tackle it. And so I, I do think that Partnerships and, and, and smart communities need to come down from the high tech to the low tech. Mm -hmm. And I particularly like what you said about 
let us study the context and let us deal with the reality that we have. And you know what? That reality mostly has to do with low-tech solutions. Mm -hmm. Low-tech solutions with very uh, smart technologies behind them. But usually very low-tech because they involve um, having more of the community about it and thinking together about the future and shaping uh, public space and, 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 and shaping society and education and a school and how we spend our time from the perspective of people that live together and not from the nature of the, of, of the animal, let's say, or, or of the human. Yeah. And so that, that is the part that we are interested in, because if we deal with that in that way, then look at what is starting to happen. Only in 2015 has the world come to realize that our development model needs to be universal. Only 2015. Only in 2015 we have come to have, to adopt a universal agenda knowing that the future of humanity needs to be very similar in the global north and the global south, the east and the west, the big and the small. It doesn't matter what your context is. The thinking, the reflection needs to be the same. Now, my hope is that the next step is that we start looking at society not as a productivity society, but as a creat creative society. And if we manage to, to do that, and we manage to have a sound partnership with technological solutions, I think we will come a long way. Excellent. Great. Um, really resonate really well with, with those comments. I think uh, when I think about who we're talking about, I think first it's really important that we understand why we're trying to achieve an inclusive society, an inclusive organization, is because we fundamentally believe by taking a diverse set of views, a diverse set of thinking, a diverse set of representation, greater value, greater utility is created. And so what that means is, is that we are such, we gotta fight this, this desire we have to put people in buckets based on what we physically see. We're describing people in ways that were, that were done you know, before the, the internet was born, right? We're still describing us in what we physically see where the reality is, is we are very complex, right? And an example I will give you is I travel a lot of miles. I mean, I probably travel 350,000 miles a year. And every time I get ready to get on the plane, maybe one or two trips, I get this panic attack because I reach down and I don't have my Bose headphones, right? <laughs> Those noise canceling headphones. And say, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is because this beautiful young couple with these kids two and four, no matter where Joseph Bradley sits on that plane, they're going to find me. <laughs> and they want to express all their joy, right? So Joseph Bradley, African-American male, millennial, <laughs> looking for a pair of headphones in that minute is very, very different than Joseph Bradley, African-American male, looking for a pair of headphones on the weekend with my son. In the first example, I'm going to that kiosk. I might buy two or three. I don't care what it costs. I just need it, right? I need it there. I need batteries. I might buy extra stuff. In the second example, on the other hand, hey, I want to be intellectually stimulated. I got more time. I want to be entertained. And so I think it's fundamentally important that we really start just deciding and describing people based on their behaviors, especially when in the city. It's really, really important because we want to bring together a diverse group of people to create greater innovation and create greater value. And I can tell you now that in some of the, in the communities where, uh, where, where I where my had a good fortune of, of bringing up our kids in a, in a very nice community, that that was racially diverse. But I can tell you right now, if you asked all those kids about their life experiences, they were the same. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter what they looked like, what killed their skin appearance. They all grew up in a pretty nice neighborhood. Now, at the same time, if you went across the street or you went 20 miles away, you might have a group that, 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 again, might have looked the same. They may have all been of the same race. But if you ask them about their experiences, richly and uniquely different. So I think it's really about focusing on um, understanding and classifying and talking about people based on behaviors rather than what we can initially just see. Excellent. Thank you, Joseph. I think we're hitting common themes. I mean, I, I think if we garbled the titles, you would not know who's 
I mean, we, we really, the panel is emphasizing the importance of collaboration, how it works, how context matters. Maybe in one or two words to each one of the panelists, how do we address the unintended con consequences? How do we ensure that technology does not exacerbate the haves and the have-nots, the connected and the not connected? And if we can do it in one or two minutes, we can leave maybe five minutes in the end for audience questions. Well, before it was said, actually, it's not the connected and the non-connected because you may want not to be connected. <laughs> and I also think, I was thinking when you were talking that you said it's just about low tech, that this is such in contrast to what you see outside this door. <laughs> so, you know, outside this door, I mean, what, like the picture of the smart city looks like is a very different. I mean, it's basically tracking devices everywhere, technology actually <laughs> being the big master. So I think this is in, uh, in very much in um, yeah, there is a huge discrepancy <laughs> to what we are saying. It's exactly really solving real needs and what it is being produced. I also think that definitely, I mean, I work a lot on the question of data sovereignty and the question of um, redistribution of wealth and power uh, from the digital revolution. And, and a part of it, of course, is addressing the question of data, data sovereignty and artificial intelligence because now, uh, it is hard to say that technology will solve things where you see that, you know, uh, just a few amount of companies have the ability to use AI to do something meaningful and even less people in the world understand this technology to contribute to solve those problems. Maybe 700 uh, very high skilled um, developers and data scientists that can do that. So this is a huge challenge. We want to build it more ethically. We want to make sure that the immense value that will be created out of this technological revolution will be for the many and not for a few. And so it is going to be about, um, on one side in government, we always tend to say regulation. Of course, I mean, Europe is doing uh, quite a few things to make sure bold policies like in international trade or taxation or even regulating, uh, putting ethics and security at the very core. But I believe we also need to look at the kind of bottom-up um, approaches, not only what uh, governments can do. And, um, and maybe to make sure that technology is not going to accelerate the type of problems that we have and even accelerating our faith in liberal democracy. So this is a, b a very big danger that we fear. Also because people are not secure, they fear that they lost control, they lost their privacy, they lose their ability to govern where the world is going. So we need to take this um, kind of democratic control a bit back, I think. And so uh, I think we, 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 we should do that if we don't want to, if we want to avoid that the situation will uh, just continue to to speed up in ways that we we can't make sure that we embed the rule of law democracy and human rights in the technology that we built so i think that's the challenge that we're facing how do we bake uh, democracy the rule of law and the human rights in artificial intelligence and the future of technology Egan? i think it's uh you know much of what we've already said is the the answer to ensuring a more inclusive outcome, which is to understand what people want and, and contextually mm -hmm. uh, specific. I think that's right. It's not just who you are. Uh, we are all maybe different people in need of different things, depending on what the it's situation is. So I think to better understand that and, and pay close attention to it, I do think that the conversations could be less about technology and more about outcomes. Um, and, and let the solutions um, be responsive to the demand as instead of the reverse, which again is a common theme of, that's been discussed today. I think you could use data uh, or use um, different means, insights, uh, in a way to measure the inclusive outcomes and make sure that we're, we're actually achieving what we set out to achieve. Um, and because that can, that can be, you know, um, a slippery slope that you can make a lot of progress in one direction, um, and you ne need to make sure that you're you're getting the outcomes that that you want. I think it's also to be uh, cognizant of people's um, need and and demand for privacy, but also inclusive uh, uh, solutions, and so that they see uh, they see these things as uh, contributors to um, progress for them, and not. Um, threats and and I think that's 
uh, in large part for us to think about how we um, engage with each other in, in terms of developing the solution and, and uh, being true to form in terms of what outcome we're, we're expecting. And people, whether you call it d democracy, uh, democracy or participatory or, you know, you, there's lots of words that mean people need to be involved, right? Um, it, citizens do have a responsibility for the outcomes that uh, happen to them, right? They need to be engaged and I think we need to give them space for that to occur and take, take that uh, responsible approach. And sometimes that's not easy and it's not quick and, and, and oftentimes it is more complex to engage uh, in those conversations. Mm -hmm. But I think that empathy and understanding is critical to the inclusive outcome. Emilia, one minute. Yes, I, I think some of the most important things that the closest level of government to the people do is inform. I think that one of the key policies that, for instance, let us take Barcelona as an example, is doing in terms of, of um, energy poverty is, is informing people that they actually have the right to not be cut off electricity when they are not able to pay it. And that is, is groundbreaking because people didn't know this. Yes. You know, people just accepted that they were cut off uh -huh. because they couldn't pay it. Hmm. And so information is extremely important and is one of these roles that local governments need to play. Um, local governments are service providers, but not necessarily uh, looking for the technical solution to the service provision. And I think that that's extremely important that we make that difference and that the oversight of service delivery and the governance of the service delivery is what, is, is what local governments focus on. And one last thought is we need to make sure that we build democracy from the local reality up because it will be the only one that is going to protect us and save us from a global citizenship that is based on uh, being seen as a consumer and as a client. We are humans with rights and aspirations. We are not clients and consumers. That comes later and we only uh, consume and our clients to be able to reach the kind of happiness that we all aspire to. But local governments, democratic, um, uh, democratic aspirations and need to be built on, this, on the monitoring of that type of citizenship in, in my view. And it will become global very soon and it needs to be built from the local. Mm. Excellent. Great. Um, I, I, I would just add uh, I think to keep technology in, in check, so to speak, it's not necessarily about changing our answers, but fundamentally about changing our questions, um, for, especially for AI, right? You, you, you got to fundamentally ask and understand what decisions are you going to allow AI to make? That should not be by default. That should be a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. The second thing I think you have to make sure you ask yourself is how are we going to eliminate bias in the data? Because if we don't eliminate bias in the data, we're just gonna bring that forward, yeah. right? It's gonna be your mess for less, but it's still gonna be a mess. Um, and, and the last thing, when you think about, uh, when, you, when you think about you know, uh, artificial intelligence, is ask the question, what happened when it did something wrong? Mm. You can't have AI be a black box. You've gotta fundamentally understand what those decisions are. You don't need to have a math degree, you don't need to be a PhD to ask these questions, because if we don't ask these questions, we're gonna end up with a lot of unintended consequences. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, I got uh, the list of questions that the audience asked, and I think the panelists covered the two main most voted ones, which was about issues of collaboration and what policies can foster it. And the second one uh, was about, you know, how do you ensure that there's no divide between the haves and the have-nots. So I think you know, these issues were very well covered by our panelists. Maybe I'll give each one of them maybe one last word, like your <laughs> parting sentence. We start from the... We start from Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, again, you know, don't worry about what you don't know. <laughs> Wake up each and every day, be vocal, be active, participate and challenge what you believe to be true. Emilia? Um, we cannot give the responsibility of the common good to those that are in business to make profit. 
we as citizens together, together with all the actors, need to take responsibility for the common good. And then, of course, yes, we need to ensure that we work with the private sector to improve our quality of life. But society needs to be built from the public perspective. Miguel? I think we need to leverage the power of collaboration. I think we need to acknowledge that uh, the big urban challenges are best solved uh, by a collaborative approach. Uh, even if you are uh, a big city that can do it on your own, you're probably best to, to involve a collaborative approach because you're going to build better solutions by including that diverse perspective. Francesca? My slogan of the day is that uh, we need a, a smart city of, that is a city of rights and not a city of privilege. Excellent. And with that, can I ask the audience to join me in a round of applause for our fantastic panel. Thanks. Thank you. That was nice. Thank really you. nice. And I wanted to thank you all for participating you. and for sending these excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Sameh. Thank you. <laughs>